Uh, why healing works. <clears throat> why healing works. And this is not what I was going to originally teach on. Uh, so I have inserted a second part to this. So um, last week we we're talking about, um, let's see here. Last week we we're talking about how sickness is part of the curse. Sickness is part of sin. Sickness entered the world because of sin. And there's a lot of curses in the scriptures um, that pretty much allow sickness to come to us. But because of the blood of Jesus, who's in Galatians, the Bible says that he became a curse for us. So he could free us from the curse, right? So that's like a fast forward version of, of the part one. Part two was supposed to go into more about um, how we're, we're part of the people of God. And how, because I had a guy ask me one time, you know, what's that scripture? Who's that scripture written to? Because I was actually quoting to him in Exodus where it says, um, you will not be barren or miscarry. Okay, the scripture says you will not be barren or miscarry. Well, when I told my friend this, he's like, well, who was that talking to? Well, the reason I was asking that question was because he wanted to see if he could invalidate it because he's going to say, oh, that was written to the Jews. Well, I have a whole lot more to talk about that, um, which I'm not going to talk about today, because um, today I really feel led to talk more uh, about some other things. Um, if you don't know, my sister just passed away uh, last Friday, and then my mom had a stroke the same exact day, and she's got bone cancer, and it just pretty much looks you know, pretty impossible. Um, but we serve a God way bigger than any of that. And um, so we're going to talk about uh, part two. I renamed it, restructured it. It's called Don't Look With Your Eyes. Don't look with your eyes. <clears throat> and I'm also going to debunk a bunch of scriptures that people use all the time to um, talk about how, you know, sometimes God doesn't want to heal you. For instance, uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says this. Have you ever heard anybody say, you know, trust in the Lord, you know, don't lean on your understanding. And they use that all the time to almost discredit your, like, you don't have to believe in healing because you can just trust God and not lean on your own understanding. But the reason why that's a problem is because it's completely in violation of the whole chapter of, Psalm, of Proverbs chapter 3. If you look at the beginning of Proverbs chapter 3, not Psalm, Proverbs chapter 3, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they'll add to you. What does that sound like? That doesn't sound like dying early. <laughs> it sounds like having a full life. You know, what? I think uh, Jacob was 120 something years old. And he was like at the ripe old age of 100 and I think 30. I don't remember. I can't remember how old he was. Um, but like, whenever, whenever he uh, was, when they asked him his age, when the Pharaoh asked him what his age was when he came into the land of, of Goshen, He's, he told him his age is over 100 something years old. And he's like, at the ripe old age. The ripe old age. You know, I find it interesting. Why does he, just a side note, why is it called ripe old age? It's because there's a harvest coming of your soul. And if you don't reach 130, 150, maybe 900 years old, you're not very ripe. <laughs> you're still a little early pickings. You see what I'm saying? Uh, I actually don't believe 120 years is the longest you can live. Uh, I actually think 120 years was actually in reference to the flood and when the flood was going to come. And that's not from biblical um, examples. That's from an extra biblical example and some traditional thinking. Um, but uh, if you, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not validating or I'm not condoning reading this book. But if you're a biblical scholar, you do read other books too. Okay. And so I'm going to say this, but please don't, you know, be like, oh, Zach, you're adding stuff to the scripture. No, it's sometimes you read things that just help complement a little bit of understanding, but they're not fully authoritative. Okay. Have I clarified myself enough? Yeah. So in the book of Enoch, it talks about the 120 years. And it says that, <clears throat> um, actually, it might be in Peter. <laughs> One second. Peter yeah. Dude. Peter, he was a herald of righteousness. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, um, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, He did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness. Herald of righteousness means he was a preacher of righteousness. Well, you don't hear him preaching in the book of Genesis. Nowhere in the book of Genesis, or, uh, Genesis is uh, Noah preaching to anybody. 
But in the book of Enoch, it says that he preached righteousness and repentance for 120 years. So that's where I'm getting that information that I actually believe personally that the 120 years was something that was understood by the people of the time as the time from the time that Noah was prophesied by God. God gave him the word that the flood's going to come 120 years. So he had 120 years to preach righteousness and repentance. Okay? That's what I personally believe. Let me clarify again. The book of Enoch is not authoritative canonical scripture that we all hang our hat, hang, hang our hat on. And if I was to say it would, I would get crucified. So <clears throat> um, I'm just saying that, okay? So I actually believe it's longer than that. And I actually don't even think you even have to die. That's just my personal opinion. I mean, Enoch was in an old covenant and he, he didn't even die. And then you have Elijah, he didn't even die. So, I mean, just my personal opinion. That both of those people completely violated the whole rule in Ecclesiastes that says it's appointed for every one person to die. Well, what about Enoch and Elijah? Sorry, they broke it. They broke it. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All things are possible. So, why do we pray for healing? You know, why do we pray for resurrection? The reason why is because we, we have a promise coming. And have you ever watched, have you ever, you know, you're going to get ready to watch a two-hour movie, right? And, and before you watch the two-hour movie, what do you watch first? A three-minute, two-minute, one-minute preview, right? It's called a preview. It gives you the snippets. It gives you the, the appetizer of what's to come. So when we pray for healing and we pray for resurrection from the dead, what we're praying for is an appetizer of what's to come. It's actually, a, did you, check this out. If I pray for you to get healed, it's a temporary healing. If I pray for you to come back from the dead, it's a temporary resurrection. It's a preview of eternity. This is why we can pray for it. Because we're just giving everybody a sneak peek. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Why? No one's going to go see the movie if they don't see a preview. How many movies have you watched that you didn't see a preview of? Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. You know, look, we're going to pray for some previews, baby. We're going to pray for the dead to come back. And by the way, you're never going to see the dead come back if you don't pray for them to come back. Well, if you say, well, I've never seen anybody pray for the dead. I've never seen the dead come back. Well, how many dead people have you prayed for to come back? <laughs> None. I prayed for, personally, I prayed for three, maybe four people that were dead to come back. Because i got to get some practice in. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you don't practice, you'll never see it. If you never pray for the dead to come back, you'll never see somebody get back raised from the dead. You ever heard of David Hogan? David Hogan, pretty on fire guy for God. I think he's raised like 500 people from the dead. I can't remember. Uh, or maybe his team has raised 500 people from the dead. But he has not raised all those people from the dead. He's raised only a few. And like his whole team because of the faith that's built because of his testimonies, they have raised all these people from the dead. And I say they have raised people from the dead. We all know God does the work through us. Okay? Even God, even Jesus, the scripture. Okay. We're getting off here. I'm going to share something with you. It might mess you up. Okay? <clears throat> um, okay. Here we go. Acts chapter 2, um, verse 22. Look, I want to show you how powerful this is. God wants to do miracles through you, okay, period. End of the story. Get over it. If you're not doing it, then, you know, we got to get with it, right? Um, <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 22. I want, to, I want you to see, like, how God, how the, how the scriptures, the book of Acts, actually references Jesus' ministry and how, he, how they talk about him. They don't, in this, I, we all believe Jesus is the Son of God and he's God, he's deity, right? But in this passage right here, what we're about to read, it doesn't seem to be talking about the divinity of Jesus is talking about the humanity of Jesus. So if we go to Exodus chapter 2, verse 22, it says, Men of Israel, can y'all see this? No? Uh, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, y'all notice they're not pointing out his deity here, a man attested to you by God, talking about him almost like he's a separate person, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him. This doesn't even say that Jesus did the signs and wonders. It's saying that God did the miracles through Jesus. Now, if that don't trip you up, I don't know what will. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up was this delivered up according to the def definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Man, God raised him up. Did you know that Jesus didn't raise himself up from the dead? God raised him up. 
God. Wait, I thought Jesus was God. Well, let's just put that aside for a second. We know Jesus is God. We know there's a Trinity here. Jesus is the Son of God, right? And he's also, he's, Jesus is the Son of God. That's the part of the Trinity he's in. We have the Holy Spirit, which is a, another facet of the, of the Godhead. And then we have the Father God. But there's clear distinction between the three. And the Father God is the one who did the signs and wonders through Jesus, the man. It didn't say the God. It says right here, the man. Bear with me. We know that the whole Godhead came into Jesus. I'm clear, right? No one's going to call me a heretic, are they? No, but what we do know is that Jesus was a man. And right here, it doesn't say that he did his miracles in his divinity. Right here, this is my best evidence right here, that Jesus did his miracles through his manhood by the Father God through him. Now, this is just mind-blowing because whenever we see him calm the sea, we think, oh, that was because he was God. No, it's because he was man operating in faith, doing what his father is doing, and his father worked through him and did the signs and wonders through him as a man. Yeah. It's true. Amen? It's true. So powerful. And God raised him up. Listen, what you have to understand is that when Jesus came, here's another scripture. Let's go over to Philippians, just to, just to show you how much of a man God, Jesus became, okay? Philippians chapter 4, whoa, all right, here we go, therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, so now, right, uh, no, it's still, have this mind among yourselves, which is, is yours in Christ Jesus, verse six. So this is Philippians chapter two, verse five and six. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So we know he was the form of God, but he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now that's also mind blowing. What is he doing? What, look, he emptied himself. What does that mean? That means he was God, but he emptied himself. He made himself weak. He made himself vulnerable. He made himself just like you and me, which means when he did everything he did, it was a sign and an example of what we are also able to do and supposed to do. Yeah. <clears throat> By taking the form of a servant, listen, all your miracles, they're not going to be done because something's great about you. They're going to be done because you're a servant. Being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. It's not all about the miracles. It's also about the cross. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Everybody likes to, well, I want to get healed. I proclaim my prosperity. Well, what about the suffering? Because we, <laughs> you're going to get the glory through the suffering. And the suffering isn't just about getting sick and stuff. That's what I'm talking about. The suffering is when you operate through love in Christ. When you love, you always die. It always leads to death. Love always leads to death. For God so loved the world that he gave his only... For God demonstrated his own love for us that it, his son Christ... While we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Whenever we decide to follow Jesus, it always leads to death. But by the grace and power of God, we're all resurrected, right? I always tell people, if I pray for somebody to get raised from the dead five minutes later, what's cooler? Five minutes, three days, 2,000 years. It doesn't really matter. We all come back. You can't kill me. <laughs> it's only temporary, you know? It's a slight hiccup inside the plan, you know? It's just a temporary glitch, you know what I mean? Okay, all right, let's get back over here. So that's... Way off. Okay, let's get back to my notes. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 3. My son. Can y'all see this? All right. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 1 through 8. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. So this is talking about favor, right? So we're not going to get into teaching about favor today, but whenever you obey the word of God and you don't forget his teachings, it adds life to, adds days to your life, adds favor to your work, 
And also, right here, verse 5, it says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Okay, is this is where everybody says, don't lean, on, don't lean on your understanding. We don't know what God's doing. You, know, you can't possibly know the will of God, which is a lie. Why does God continually tell us to pray to seek the will of God if we aren't supposed to know the will of God? Like, it's so bizarre. I mean, in one church I grew up, we've got to pray for the will of God. Yeah, but it's not praying for the will. It's praying to be revealed to you what the will of God is, which means you can know the will of God. And I'm telling you right now, it's funny because there are some teachers that I'm like, man, golly, uh, they're just a little too religious. Uh, but at the same time, they say some really good stuff. Like, if it says it in the Word, you don't need to hear God. Well, there's scriptures, there's promises in the Bible that give us belief, they give us promises for our healing. I, I don't have to hear God to know if you're supposed to be healed. The word says, by his stripes we're healed. And the scripture says that he wishes none should perish, but all should, be, should repent and be saved. Well, being saved is soterios, which is not just eternal salvation, it's also healing. It's the will of God that everyone be healed. Of course God wants a sinner to get healed. So he can testify about Jesus and what he did in his life. Oh, my gosh. Okay, listen. Like, I, whenever you see um, the man at the, at the gate, right, uh, who, is le- who is lame, and the, the guy said, I don't have any gold or any silver. He says, but this I do have. Rise and walk. He didn't try to convert the guy first. He just raised him up. And then everybody got saved. The evangelism, <laughs> the theological evangelism explanation happened after the fact, after the guy got healed. And the guy was not saved. He didn't even repent. You don't have to repent to be healed. You just have to have someone who already did repent pray for you to get healed. Yeah. Why? Because we carry the blessing. That's what Jesus, that's what Peter said. He said, I don't have silver and gold, but this I do have in the name of Jesus. Get up and walk. So Peter didn't give uh, to the man what the man was, what had. You know, he didn't receive salvation at that moment. No, Peter had salvation. And Peter gave salvation in the form of healing for that man. Powerful stuff. Didn't take him through any Roman roads. Not that I'm not knocking that. I'm saying we should. Roman roads, I've used it a lot. Um, my point is, in that situation, he didn't try to convert the guy before he got healed. Sometimes people say, you know what people do when people say, here's my opinion. When people say, oh, they need to repent of their sins before they get healed. That's a lazy man's way of getting, of copping out of you having faith for somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to come up with some reason why you don't have to pray for the guy to get healed because you probably, you know, struggle with some doubt and unbelief. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your understanding. This is so powerful stuff. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is not talking about when things don't go your way that you should trust the Lord and lean not on your understanding. No, it's actually saying whenever it looks impossible, for instance, when the Israelites were standing in front of the Red Sea, they were not supposed to trust in their own understanding. In their own understanding, they were going to die. We're all going to die. And this, this is where you would quote the scripture. Hey, guys, trust the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Watch this. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your straight paths. And in NLT, it says, seek the Lord's will, and he will reveal it to you. Okay? That's a paraphrase. Verse 7. Be not wise in your own eyes. You know what that means? Don't look with your eyes to get your wisdom. Well, it's not working. Well, maybe it's not God's will. Where did you hear that? Did the voice from heaven say it wasn't the will of God for the guy to get healed? If, you're, if you can't tell me that God said that, which is contradictory to the word, then I don't want to hear you say it. Jesus never said it. Jesus never taught it. Never once do you ever hear Jesus ever teach. And I'm, I'm okay with someone challenging me on this and putting it in, in the comments on the videos and coming it to me after if I'm wrong because I want to know the word. I'm always repenting. Always when I think I know something and I figure something out, I repent and teach it a different way, okay? But I haven't yet found Jesus talk about that it wasn't the will of God, that when someone didn't get healed, that it wasn't the will of God. You know what he did say? Because of your unbelief. That's what he said. And nobody wants to hear that. Whoa, 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 whoa. You know why we, you know why we prefer the will of God versus the unbelief teaching? It's because if I say it's the will of God, well, then it's God's fault, not mine. You know what I'm saying? 
But then you have preachers that say, I'm not going to veer from the text. Well, stop veering from the text and tell the truth then and tell us all that it's because of our unbelief. Because that's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 17, whenever the disciples came to him and said, why could we not cast out the demon? He said, because of your unbelief. Or actually in one translation, it says, because of your little faith. Which a lot of us don't like to use that because we talk about the mustard seed and say, well, we just have to have a little mustard seed faith. But Jesus actually used that illustration when he's talking about the mustard seed faith to slam them and say, your faith's so small, it's not even the size of a mustard seed. That's what he's saying. And you think, how are you going to measure a mustard seed faith? Oh, I have a little, people say, all you have to have is a little faith. No, 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 no. All you have to have is a mustard seed size of faith. How do you know? How do you know that you have a mustard seed size of faith? Because the mountain moves. If the mountain doesn't move, you don't have a mustard seed faith. The evidence of mustard seed faith is that the mountain moves. Jesus told us very clearly, if you have man. Father, thank you. If you have man, why do we have to make it? Why do we have to water down the words of Jesus? You know why we have to water down the words of Jesus? Because we don't like them. That's why. We don't like them. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes us check ourselves instead of check God. It's very hard. It's difficult. It's hard to swallow this, but it's still the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and the truth will set you free if you get it. You know, anyway, powerful stuff. Okay, be not wise in your own eyes. In other words, don't, don't try to understand it with your eyes. Quit looking with your eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Verse 8, it will be, am I there yet? No. But if I don't preach to myself, I ain't ever going to get there because nobody else is preaching it. <laughs> you know, anyway, praise God. Okay, watch this. Look at this. Look at this. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. People use this all the time to say, well, so-and-so died because, well, we should just trust and we should just trust God and not lean on, and, and not lean on our own understanding. But this passage is very clearly saying that when you trust the Lord and lean not on your own understanding, then you get healed. What? This is so opposite from what people teach. It's just because people, like, people conveniently leave other scriptures out so they can teach their own theology and their own doctrine. But they don't like to really swallow the whole scripture. And I just pray in the name of Jesus that I'll be just as bold about things that I don't like either. You know, because there's things that I read, and I'm like, golly, man, this hurts. But I love what Francis Chan says. He says, if it's in here and I don't like it, I just have to assume that I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Did I do a good impersonation? <laughs> Scripture quoted out of context all the time is Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, or neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, or so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. People always use this scripture as an excuse for why so and so died of cancer. Okay? And my mom has cancer. She's got bone cancer, uh, breast cancer went to her bones. So I'm not saying this. Uh, when I say this, I'm saying it with boldness because I believe the word of God more than I believe what I see with my eyes. Yeah. Period. I don't care. And I'm risking a lot. Amen. You know? And I've said it before and didn't have that on the line. But I better just be as bold as I was before because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you I have more faith then. I need to get back there. For as the heavens are higher than the earth. Look, let's go there. Look, man, I'm telling you, dude. Uh, so what's, what's interesting about this passage is Isaiah 55, they were using this scripture saying, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, my ways are, neither are my ways your ways, right? Declares the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. What is it referencing? Well, if you read it in context, if you just pull it out like this, like most people do who don't read their Old Testament, <laughs> people don't read their Old Testament. You've got to read your Old Testament. It's God-breathed. It's God-inspired. You have to read your Old Testament, and you have to read it in its entirety. You have to read it in chunks. You have to gorge yourself on the Word of God. Don't read just little pieces. And do some study. Figure out who he's writing to, you know? 
for my thoughts, look, where is this sandwiched in between? What is this about? In context, Isaiah 53 is talking about the suffering servant. For his stripes, by his stripes we are healed. The government will be on his shoulders. All that Christmas stuff, you know, that we read and stuff, right? Uh, the whole crucifixion is Isaiah 53 prophesying about Jesus coming. Isaiah 54 says, and I will establish them in my covenant of righteousness and peace. So all of Isaiah 53 is a picture, as an illustration of the crucifixion of Jesus coming and dying for us. <clears throat> Isaiah 54 is an illustration of our covenant of the people who can put their faith in God for this, what's going to be good for them. Like, I'm not going to fiercely assail you anymore, right? No weapon to form you shall prosper. That's all in Isaiah 54. Isaiah 55, sorry, this is Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, right? It's backwards for me. Um, Isaiah 55 is saying that God is so good that it's not just for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles. And they'll say, how can this be? And he'll say, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. Look, that's what it's saying. Watch, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 is not talking about your mom dying from cancer when you prayed and it didn't work. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the compassion of God being so great that your brain can't contain it. That's what it's talking about, which means that this scripture is awesome for healing. <laughs> it has actually a backer for healing. It's not a contradiction to when God doesn't answer your prayers. It's actually a check and a rebuke for those who think that God's not going to answer their prayers. That's what it's really about. Powerful stuff, right? Okay. All right. I'm getting excited. Y'all got me excited. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to get over here to Mark chapter 6. Oh, can y'all see it? No. Um, Mark chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. So they went out and proclaimed that, G that people should repent. I'm telling you right now, when you preach the gospel, you have to teach repentance. You have to teach repentance. It, too many times we teach a gospel that is void of repentance. I'm sorry but you cannot be saved unless you repent. The book of Acts says so. It says, repent, turn to God, and your sins will be blotted out. Okay, repentance. Now, what is repentance? Just a brief, uh, a lot of people have opinions about this, okay? But if you look up the word, the word really means remorse for sin. And I actually don't think, this is my personal opinion, a lot of people don't have their own opinions. Most people say repentance is turning 180. I don't really know if I agree with that totally, okay? What repentance is, is remorse for your sin. And what I mean by this is not shame, not guilt. Not, they're different. Repentance is remorse. It's whenever you are sick about your sin, when you hate your sin, when you don't want to sin anymore. Shame and guilt don't always lead to that. That's why the Bible says there's a worldly remorse that leads to destruction and a godly remorse that leads to life. I think it's in one of the Corinthians letters. I can't remember which one. <clears throat> we can put it on the screen, okay, Dre? <clears throat> remorse, though. It's godly. Repentance is godly remorse. And godly remorse does lead to life change. But look, when you look in the, in the, in the, in the, in the gospel of Acts chapter, uh, not in the gospel, in the, in the book of Acts, Chapter 3, verse 19. <clears throat> it says right here, repent, therefore. Can you all see it? And, and turn back. So look, there's repentance, and then there's turning back. You see what I'm saying? So I think that repentance is actually the remorse that you feel, but then you have to turn back. Case in point, whenever... Judas found out they were going to kill Jesus. He repented. Did y'all know that? The Bible says he repented. And he took the silver back to the priest, 
threw the silver back at the priest and says, I've portrayed innocent blood. They didn't take it back from him. What, <clears throat> what happened, though, in that moment, his repentance didn't lead to salvation. His repentance led to guilt, shame, condemnation. He did not turn to God. Y'all see that? So he hung himself. What's the difference between Judas and Peter? Peter repented, but he turned back to God. He knew that his salvation came from God, not his own deeds. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> so your salvation doesn't come from your deeds, but when you have faith and you repent, it leads to good deeds. This is why you'll be judged by your fruit. When the Bible says this, you will be judged by your fruit, which means that you'll be judged by your deeds. Even the New Testament says that. After Jesus, Paul says it, you'll be judged by your deeds. What does that mean? <clears throat> is it a works-based faith? No, it's a faith that leads to good works that can be tried, true, and tested. And when God sees you at the end of your life, he'll test you. You'll already have been tested. He'll, he'll judge you by your fruit. Because if you're truly of the faith, it always leads to fruit. Does that make sense? Making sense? Okay. Because faith without works is dead. And James says, if I have faith and have no works, can such faith save me? The implied answer is no. <laughs> All right, powerful stuff, right? And remorse, so remorse, godly remorse. But we have to have remorse, and that leads to repentance, all right? So that's a small mini sermon. I apologize for that, but I hope it helps somebody. Um, repentance, very, very powerful. Okay, so they taught the people. So they went out and proclaimed that Jesus should repent. Not Jesus, sorry, not Jesus. Jesus didn't have to repent. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. They healed them. Um, <clears throat> Mark chapter, this is back whenever, um, this is back whenever Jesus sent them out, right? Mark chapter 16, uh, I think I have Matthew in here. Matthew chapter 10, let's look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 8. It says, therefore, th it says, these 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is a very, very interesting thing, which we're not going to have a time to go through an entire lesson on this, but it says right here, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers. I have a question. Are there any sick people in heaven? No. That's what he's saying. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I'm bringing... Did you know that <clears throat> if you read your whole Bible, you'll find out we're not destined for heaven. You'll find out that heaven's destined for here. Yeah. It's a merging, a marriage of the two. And the, Jerusalem came out of heaven for the, for the it's, it's, a, it's a marriage, guys. It's a marriage, a union of heaven and earth, a union of the bride of Christ and Christ himself. A union. You see what I'm saying? But what is this? This is a preview. The kingdom of heaven is at hand right now. It's not later. It's now, but it is later too. It's kind of tricky. What's the evidence that the kingdom is here now? The people got healed. They got raised from the dead. The lepers got saved, right? They cast out demons. It's the evidence of the kingdom being here. So what you have to understand is that when you're going out and preaching the gospel, you're actually bringing the kingdom of heaven with you. And if you're not aware that the kingdom of heaven is with you, you're not going to be aware of the invasion that needs to happen. Yeah. There's an invasion. The kingdom of heaven is going to have to take over the kingdom of earth, which is ruled by the devil. But people say, well, God is the king of the earth. No, he's not. The Bible says that, that Satan is the prince and power of the air. The whole world, the whole world John chapter 5, verse 19 Verse 19, I said that for shock effect. He is the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Okay, please don't stone me if you're on YouTube or Facebook. <clears throat> we do know. Look, what you have to understand is John chapter 5, verse 19. This is after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. This letter was written after the ascension of Jesus. Okay, also Ephesians chapter 6. It says that we wrestle with not with blood, but with powers and principalities. So Ephesians chapter 6 also refers to a kingdom of darkness, uh, these angelic and demonic beings in the earth today, 
now, right? <clears throat> John chapter 5. So it's not like, listen, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't do yet what was prophesied in the book of Revelation that says he'll destroy him with a breath. It hasn't happened yet. But he is destroying him every day if you allow him in your life, right? John chapter 5, verse 19 says, we know that we're sons of God, but the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Okay? Uh, Matthew chapter, Luke chapter 4, <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus is being tempted by the devil, and the devil takes him up onto a mountain or whatever, to high place, and he says, look, all the kingdoms of the earth, they've all been given to me, and I give them to whom I will. If you bow down and worship me, I'll give them to you. Jesus does not argue with him and say, no, 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 devil, you're not in charge of the earth. He didn't say that. What he says is, you shall worship the Lord and yours alone. Lord alone, right? Because Jesus knew how real authority came. And that comes through submission to God. Because authority comes from authority. So when he submitted to God, what did that do? That caused him to die. Why did it cause him to die? Because there was a heavy price to pay for the prime real estate called earth. Heavy price. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the highest price to purchase the earth. Not from the devil. because It's kind of a strange thing. There was a price due. It's a legal matter more than it is a transaction. Okay? So it's not every illustration is the perfect illustration. But he did pay the highest price. When he paid the highest price... God is the one who lifted him up. You know why? Because he could legally, because he paid the price of sin and death, he could legally say, now, since you've humbled yourself, I can exalt you. So the Bible says that he, you know that Jesus did not have the name above all names until he died on the cross. Now, that's something that'll trip you up too. No, it says, therefore, he has exalted him up and given him the name above all names. Therefore, what? Because of his death. When he died on the cross, then God exalted him. Why? Because God exalts the humble, right? So Luke chapter 4, yeah, <clears throat> he, he had power and authority of the earth. But the reason why he had power and authority over the earth was because of Adam and Eve. God gave Adam and Eve authority over the earth. Adam and Eve submitted to the devil. Luke chapter 6, not Luke, Romans chapter 6 says, you become a slave of him whom you obey. So whenever Adam and Eve submitted to the devil, they forfeited their authority on the earth and gave it to Satan. So people say, well, God must have given Satan the authority. No, God gave man authority. Nowhere in the scripture does it say God gave Satan the authority. It says God gave man the authority. Man submitted to the devil. The devil took the authority over the earth. Jesus came, bought it back to give us the authority. Does it make sense? All right, I'm probably going a little long. What time is it right now? 8.20. Oh, gosh. I am a little long. Um, <clears throat> all right, so we find a good stopping place. Um... <clears throat> So the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What we're believing for is the kingdom of God to come and invade the earth. Make sense? All right, so I'm probably just going to have to stop right there because I've gone well over time. And uh, that was exciting. Jesus is awesome. <laughs> so um, let, me, let me make sure that I, I, I close my thoughts out properly. Let me see. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So my main point is this. I wanted to say... <clears throat> that we cannot be looking with our eyes. And people use certain scriptures all the time to, to try to validate uh, the opinion that God doesn't want to answer our prayers. But the truth is, those scriptures are really for us to not look with our eyes, but to instead look at our promise and refuse. Look, I'm telling you right now, the Canaanite woman was the wrong crowd. The, she... Jesus said, I didn't come to the Gentiles. I came to save the lost sheep of Israel. You know what Jesus was saying? The same thing my friend was saying. Who is that written to? It's not written to you. That promise in the Old Testament doesn't belong to you because you're a Gentile. That's what Jesus told that woman. He said the same thing. I didn't come to save you. I came to save these other people. And she said, yeah. He says, she, she said she, she pleaded more, right? He goes, it's not right for me to give the bread of the children to the dogs. They call her names. <laughs> they start calling her names. But that woman, 
did not take no for an answer. And she didn't give a hoot whether or not it was her promise or not. <laughs> she believed that God was so good. She believed that he was so good that she could have that promise anyway. <laughs> she didn't believe in a, in a, in, in a, listen, at that point, that woman wasn't believing in the word. That person was, that woman was believing in the character of God. She was believing that God was so good and loving that she also could take it. So she said, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the children's plates. And that man, Jesus, he said, great is your faith, woman. Be it according to your faith. Listen, it, she didn't get it because it belonged to her. She didn't give it, get it because it was a promise. She got it because she believed I think that Jesus always spoke the truth. Yeah. And yes, he did test her, but everything he said was still true. Yeah. It wasn't for her. But this is what we're learning is that there's a day there. First of all, God never breaks his own word. So everything he said was true. On the other hand, yeah. he did leave out key important things, which are that this promise will go to the Gentiles. Yeah. He didn't tell her that. She ignored God's timing. And also, if you think about it, so did the Gentile woman. Because if the timing of God, because even in Matthew chapter 10, he said, go not to the Gentiles, but go to the lost sheep of Israel. Why? Because it wasn't time technically yet for the Gentiles to have the promise because Jesus hadn't died yet. And so the promise wasn't being extended to the Gentiles quite yet technically in the timeline. Right. But these people of faith always pulled down something that didn't belong to them. Because that's what faith does. God's not moved. Look, his, he's bound by his word, but he's moved by your faith. Yeah. He's bound by his word, but he's moved by your faith. Amen? All right, we better quit. Let's pray it out. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Father. Oh, you're too good. You're too good. And we just, right now, we just want to lift up everyone that's uh, dealing with sickness. <clears throat> might be watching this. We just rebuke the devil right now. We come against every infirmity right now. And we, we say you're under the feet of Jesus. And we tell you, we command you, get out of their body. Leave them alone. We command full restoration in their body. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen.